The goal of every investor is to find a stock today that is worth a certain amount, but that is going to rise in value either in the short term or in the long term, or ideally both. And we look to try to identify stocks that might be potentially undervalued or overlooked by the market, or at least a bare minimum that they're fairly valued and likely to rise for an investor who's willing to take a risk. There are actually some very effective ways to do that analysis that are, don't take very long and can build a nicely diversified undervalued portfolio. And there are some other ways that are really popular, but really bad, like the PE ratio. So let's talk about what the P.E. ratio actually is. Uh, P.E. stands for price to earnings. And I, I could summarize the way that most investors are introduced to the P.E. ratio pretty simply. That a low P.E. ratio is good, meaning undervalued or fairly valued stocks. And a stock with a high P.E. ratio is bad, meaning that they are likely to be overvalued. Now, sometimes that actually can be true, but it, unfortunately, even when it is true, it's not actually very helpful for investors. So let's do a little bit of definitions first. Let's just talk about what the P.E. ratio actually is for uh, a lot of folks out there who might not even know how this is calculated and some of the questions that arise immediately. So the P.E., it's an abbreviation. It stands for price, meaning the share price uh, versus earnings per share, which I'm going to abbreviate as EPS, earnings per share, profits per share, net income per share. It's all the same thing. So already this raises a question. Uh, price is going to be today's price, which fluctuates. Sometimes the market can be particularly volatile. And earnings per share, well, are we talking about the most recent quarterly report? Maybe we times that by four to get an annual number? Or are we looking at the trailing 12 months, the last 12 months, which is generally considered to be best practice and pretty common? Or an, another common approach would be the last full fiscal year, which if you're uh, quite a ways along in the new year is going to be a really old number, not very helpful at all. So this already raises a few questions as to when you're looking at a PE ratio on a on your brokerage platform or uh, a finance portal, what are you actually looking at? Is it is it good numbers, more recent numbers, or are they bad numbers? So the one way to think about this, so let's let's imagine that there's a stock that you're interested in and uh, maybe it's priced at twenty dollars per share. And it has an earnings per share uh, over the last 12 months, since that, that does tend to be best practice. Let's say that it has earnings per share of $1 uh, per share, earnings per share. So we can do an easy uh, calculation here on this uh, quotient. We find that the P-E ratio in this scenario, so the P-E ratio in this scenario is 20. Which actually is, that's roughly the long-term average for the S&P 500 is right in that range, a little higher than that, but that's actually not all that uncommon, 18 to about 27, something in that range for the S&P 500 is, is about average. Is that good? Is that bad? Can we compare stocks in one industry group compared to another, their PE ratios to, to identify relative value? Well, the answer to all those questions is basically no. So here's what we have to think about. Although sometimes it is true that a stock with a low P-E ratio may actually be uh, slightly undervalued or a stock with a really high P-E ratio might be overvalued, it, it's we can't use those uh, exceptions to the rule, if you will, or the rule I'm going to tell you about uh, to, to in any effective way in constructing a portfolio. So for example... This is Haynes Brands, and they have a P.E. ratio right now of 812. That means that basically what's happening here is that investors are paying uh, $812 per share per dollar of earnings. So, so they, they are not making very much per share. Their earnings per share is well under a dollar. So it looks pretty bad. And of course, if, as you look at the chart, performance is really bad. It's kind of what you would expect. Quest Diagnostics, so this is another company, their P.E. ratio is 9, which means that investors are spending only $9 per dollar of earnings, which sounds really good. That's actually a lot cheaper than the S&P 500 itself. And, and of course, I cherry pick this a little bit to find some examples that might look like you would expect it to look between Haynes Brands and Quest Diagnostics. On average, however, what happens is unless you have the ability to see into the future, and to identify those stocks that actually have a low P.E. ratio and that will, in fact, outperform like Quest or those with a high P.E. ratio and that you'll avoid them like Haynes Brands. Unless you have the ability to do that, then it, 
we're kind of out of luck with the PE ratio because it actually works the opposite way that you would expect. In fact, across the S&P 500, so we've got 500 stocks that we can compare. And if we were to look at the top 50, meaning the stocks with the highest PE ratio, so the 50 stocks with the highest PE ratio, the top 10% in the S&P 500, they outperform in both bull and bear markets. Now, just to make my point here, that is true on almost all time intervals. So as of this recording, for example, the top 50 over the last week are up 1.2%. The rest of the S&P 500, so the bottom 450, are up 0 .786, uh, 738. Uh, over the last month, the bottom 450 are down 1.47%, and the top 50 are up 1.16%. Over the last quarter, it's 0.88 versus 7.5% year to date so as i'm recording this year to date the bottom 450 are up 20 percent the top 50 are up 26 percent and of course over the last year meaning the last 12 months basically the bottom 450 are up 47 percent pretty good except when you compare it to the top 50 who should be overvalued based on our our normal understanding of this well they're up 62 percent so they're literally outperforming by almost 50 percent compared to their group so why is this the case? What causes a high P.E. ratio? Well, it's growth. So this is what drives P.E. ratios is growth expectations. If investors expect to see a lot of growth from a company, they are willing to pay more compared to today's earnings to get access to what they expect future earnings to be. That's what they're paying for. They're not literally paying for this year's earnings. They're paying for earnings 10 years from now, which they expect to be substantially larger. That's why they're willing to pay for that. Statistically speaking, if you go back and test the market, and it's actually very easy studies to do, buying the, the leaders tends to be a really good idea. In, in fact, sector rotation strategies have been proven over many decades of studies. Just to, to give you an example, buying the leading sectors or buying leading stocks within those sectors is, tends to be e even better. In, in fact, I oftentimes will talk to investors about the PE ratio and th they have a hard time kind of giving up on this idea because they see it in the financial press all the time. It is widely misunderstood in that same venue. And there are times that we look at the P-E ratio in ways that it's not really designed to be used. But uh, the, there can be some ways that it can give us a little bit of historical context. So, for example, one of the questions that I get quite a bit is, well, what's a normal P-E ratio for the market? Let's say just overall, uh, I'm trying to use the P-E ratio to determine whether or not the market is overvalued. Well, that's a very interesting idea. And actually, I have a chart here of the S&P 500 with the average P-E ratio of the S&P 500. And as I record this right now, so the P-E ratio is running about 35 uh, on, on average across the S&P, which is extraordinarily high. That is surprisingly high. Uh, don't let some of these spikes really distract you. Some of these, they, they are actually crisis spikes. So there's the 2008 financial crisis. Here's the dot-com crisis. Uh, P.E. ratios tend to really spike because they are past looking. They look into the past. So they, they do tend to spike when the market crashes like this. But they were not quite that high just before the crash. This is the, the, those are the crash spikes. Right now, however, if we count for that, this does seem to be extraordinarily high. And, and it is true. We oftentimes see that valuations, when they're at this level, like the P.E. ratio in this case, when they're this high, what we do detect in historical numbers is that volatility does tend to be a little bit higher, meaning that risk does, tends to be a little bit higher. But market performance overall, choppy, yes, but market performance tends to be very positive. Now, why is that? Well, because investors are buying growth for the same reason that the P.E. ratio in a given stock will be really high. The investors are willing to pay for that growth. Now, I know obviously there are a lot of stocks out there that are kind of the exceptions, but they don't prove the rule. Uh, sometimes a meme stock might take over or just something really unusual that happens that, that seems to make sense with a traditional understanding. But on average, that is just not the case. So if you're building a diversified portfolio, the PE ratio should be used in reverse of our conventional idea of what it is. One last note on this chart of the S&P 500, and it, it is at a very high valuation right now. It is tempting to look at this as something like a sell signal because high valuations or high P.E. ratios, they do tend to be correlated with market tops. 
But if we take a step back and we think about, well, what does that actually mean? In fact, by definition, a bear market happens after a market top. So what we're seeing with high valuations is in fact what we would expect to see in a bull market. Unfortunately, bull markets do end in bear markets. It's one of those inevitabilities of the, of the market. But what we, the risk we run here of using valuations in the incorrect way or the traditional understanding of valuation analysis like this is that we wind up selling the market way too early. Valuations can stay really high. In fact, valuations can stay irrationally high for a very extended period of time. Think about the run in the market 2020 through 2021, at least to date as of this recording. That is a long time that if an investor had either missed out on those opportunities or, heaven forbid, bet against the market, they would be in, uh, well, their portfolio would be in a lot of trouble. So historically, we can use a lot of these ideas to try to either avoid some kinds of bad analysis, like uh, uh, the P-E ratio being a, a indicator of either undervaluation or overvaluation. Are there other kinds of characteristics that don't fall into these traps that actually do give us an edge in finding something that is likely to rise and outperform its peers? Otherwise, why don't we just buy a, an index fund? Well, fortunately, we can do the same kind of analysis that we do on the P-E ratio to invalidate its conventional understanding to find those characteristics that, in fact, companies do share that outperform. Now, I've recorded a couple of videos on that very topic, which you can check out here and on our channel, that dig into fundamental analysis that takes a little bit more time than, than just scanning a P-E ratio, but can it doesn't take too much time, and it can help you build a portfolio that again, on average, our confidence level that these are stocks that are likely to outperform in a, in a good market or a bad market and should belong in a diversified portfolio, our confidence level can be really high.